Martin, in seeking to understand what existence is all about, we always start and focus on origins. But perhaps the future is important or maybe equally important to understand what it's all about. So mm -hmm. if, we, if we look to the far future, not just thousands and millions of years, but, but ultimately, where mm. is the universe going? Mm. Well, of course, long-range forecasts are never too reliable, <laughs> but let me do my best on that one. Uh, we can say something about the evolution of our solar system. Uh, our sun will run out of fuel in about six or seven billion years, and uh, by that time, it will... Our sun will run out of fuel after five or six billion years. It'll swell up and become a red giant, engulfing the inner planets, vaporizing any life remaining on Earth, and it'll then settle down as a white dwarf to a quiet death. But any creatures who witness the death of the sun will be as different from us as we are from bacteria. They won't be humans because the amount of time that's elapsed between now and then will be as long as the amount of time it's taken for us to evolve from the simplest organisms. But even the end of the Earth won't be the end of the universe, of course. Many stars will go on shining for much longer, but the galaxy will eventually get much dimmer because eventually all stars will die and you'll be left with the dead remnants of stars. The universe will also become a much emptier place because other galaxies which are expanding away from us with the expanding universe, they will accelerate away and disappear beyond our observational horizon. So if you were an astronomer in, say, a hundred billion years from now, the only thing you would see would be the remnant of our galaxy and Andromeda and a few other neighbors. All the rest would have disappeared completely beyond your horizon. Just our local group would be visible. Yes, its remnants, and they would be uh, very much fainter than the present day galaxies are. They would contain the dead remnants of old stars. On a longer time scale even than that, then even atoms don't live forever. We suspect that the individual atoms that make up the stars will gradually erode away in probably 10 to the power of 35 years or so. Incidentally, the uh, heat generated by the destruction of those atoms in a white dwarf star makes each star glow about as much as a 100 watt bulb throughout the rest of its lifetime. But eventually, even the stars will have gone. Black holes themselves don't live forever. They evaporate by a very slow process. So after 10 to the power 100 years, even the biggest black holes probably wouldn't exist anymore. And so after that time, we have a universe that is filled with very, very dilute radiation and maybe some stable particles that make up the dark matter, and that'll be it. So that's the simplest story. But it could be wrong for many, many reasons, of course. One possibility is that the um, force which drives the accelerating expansion may be more complicated than we think. It may change, it may um, get stronger, in which case it would tear apart even stars, or it may reverse in sign so that there may nonetheless be an eventual big crunch. We just don't know. But the forecast does seem to be for an ever colder, ever empty universe. And to quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. <laughs> and so that is the scenario we have. Although it could be wrong, we can't rule out a big crunch. But then, of course, we have to ask, could that end lead to a new beginning? And there are ideas whereby uh, what actually is the end of our universe could in some sense be linked to the beginning of a new one. But certainly the gloomy forecast of, uh, of a universe that is totally dissolute of matter has been reinforced by the notion that the, the, that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. That's right, but let's not forget that the time scales we're talking about here are so hugely long compared to any time scale for biological evolution. And uh, <clears throat> certainly by the time the sun ends its life, there could be creatures as different from us as we are from bacteria, and there could have been far more advanced entities. And so long before this happens, then there could be um, entities of superhuman intelligence, either organic or maybe based on uh, some sort of artifacts made by organic creatures. And indeed, if you were to ever 
detect artificial life or intelligent signals, we wouldn't know, of course, whether that comes from something like us or from some machines made by something like uh -huh. us. We wouldn't know at all. Some have speculated wildly that those post-humans in the future, biological mm -hmm. or, or, or machine, mm -hmm. would be so advanced that they might even be able to alter the space-time of the universe to prevent that ultimate dissolution. Is, is that even conceivably true? Well, science fiction writers can conceive of it, and uh, that's all we can hope for, because, of course, uh, it would have been hard for people a thousand years ago to conceive of the uh, present concept of the universe, and we're now talking not just about thousands of years, but about uh, billions of years, so we can't conceive at all what will happen then. And I believe that uh, as science advances, its frontiers get longer and more new questions come into focus. And the questions which scientists will be talking about 50 or 100 years from now are questions we can't even formulate. And that's just a century. So when we talk about what might happen in this longer range future, then I think uh, we can't do better than the science fiction writers. So we can't exclude that possibility. So the ultimate gloom scenario is not totally inevitable. Oh, absolutely not, because it could be wrong for scientific reasons we'll understand right. quite soon, or it could be wrong because uh, complexity develops in some way that it can actually exert some kind of feedback. We can't rule out anything. But right now, the, the, the future to beat, the future that looks like it's there, is, uh, is, is one of, uh, of uh, unhappiness. <laughs> Well, but I think it depends what timescale we think about. I think if we think about the timescale of a century, we have big challenges. And the development beyond that, here on Earth and beyond, is going to take place on the timescale of technological progress, which is much faster than the timescale of Darwinian evolution. So although it takes a million years for a species to evolve by Darwinian processes, um, I suspect that humans... Uh, will be changed within centuries because uh, those changes can be made by technology. So uh, any uh, life here on Earth a few centuries from now may not be human in that sense. So that means that whereas the time span of cosmology has extended to many billions, even trillions of years, the time span over which things are changing has actually contracted from what it was in mm -hmm. the biological past to the time span of not millions of years, but of centuries over which technology can revolutionize everything on Earth. So there's a tremendous uh, gap between the very short range of our technological predictions and the enormously long range of our cosmological predictions. And as those technological innovations begin to uh, multiply and, and, and increase exponentially, mm -hmm. it may somehow affect at least our understanding of how the ultimate future of the universe will be, if not ever our ability to change that, which seems well, almost impossible. It will certainly affect our understanding whether this allows technology to have a scenario that somehow survives this gloomy future is a different matter. But here, science fiction writers are our best guide at the moment. And generally, I would say that first-rate second fiction... Science fiction writers are our best guide at the moment. And more generally, I would say that first-rate science fiction is a greater stimulus than second-rate science in discussing all these issues.